Hi, everyone, and um, welcome to this uh, webinar from the OXA Society for Central Asian Affairs. Um, I am delighted today to be able to welcome just a really fantastic panel um, to help us understand uh, what's happening in Kyrgyzstan and um, the choices that, that face the people of Kyrgyzstan um, who will vote in a constitutional referendum in January, in addition to voting in a presidential election. Um, this, is, uh, this is an extremely timely event um, and I could not, we could not ask for, for a better panel um, of experts to talk to us about their, their own experiences and um, put all of this into historical context. Um, for me, as I approach this, one of the, um, one of the overriding questions, um, especially as um, I uh, work with the staff for the Freedom House, Freedom in the World project and, and <laughs> was just finishing preparing um, the draft um, for, for this year's Kyrgyzstan report. And um, I am left for myself kind of with the question that I, I hope our panelists today um, will shed some light on. Is this a state of emergency for democracy in Kyrgyzstan? Um, not, just, um, not just democracy overall in terms of people voting, um, but, for, um, but for the sort of small L vision of liberal democracy and um, liberal democratic values. And I'd be very interested to hear um, the input and experiences from our panelists to know these things all far better than I do. Um, so without any further delay, um, I wanna introduce our moderator today. Um, Joe Maurer is with us. He is a, um, he's an undergraduate student at the University of York in the politics department and um, is uh, the external events officer for the York Politics Society and has written in several journals about Central Asian affairs. And um, we are really thrilled to have him today as our moderator. So Joe, I'm gonna turn over to you. Um, well, thank you, um, Noah, and thank you to the OXA Society for helping make this happen. It's been absolutely great. Um, it's been really helpful. Um, so, uh, and thank you to, especially to, for all, all of you um, out there for turning up, especially if you're in Britain, because I know you could be in the pub right now, you know, getting, so getting pints, um, you've, you've chosen to come to, you know, the, the, this event instead, and it's really kind of, uh, yeah, it's, it's nice to see a really good uh, amount of panelists, uh, or amount of attendees, sorry. So um, our panelists today, we're gonna start with Bettor, no, we're gonna start with Bruce, who is at, um, he is a journalist at uh, Radio Free Europe, which is kind of a big kind of radio station over there and they write articles and they're really great. Um, yeah, um, then we're gonna go on to, um, then we're gonna go on, sorry, let me find the order again. <laughs> let me, then it's gonna be Azel, right, um, who is, uh, she's at the OEC, OSC Academy in Bishkek, a great Kyrgyz academic, really good on Twitter as well, recommend to follow. Um, she's really good. And then we get to Bettor Iskender, who is a, uh, who co-founded the Clute magazine, which is a big independent or Clute news website, big news website over in Kyrgyzstan. Um, and then finally, we've got, and these are going to be more micro looks at kind of Kyrgyzstan. And then we've got Dilo, uh, Dilo Gulamova, who is uh, going to have more macro look on how it's going to affect the region and especially EU affairs in uh, Kyrgyzstan. So I'm going to hand over to Bruce, first of all, to kind of give us an insight into Kyrgyzstan. So I'll uh, kind of give way. Great. Thank you, Joe, uh, and thanks to the OXA Society and also to the University of York for sponsoring this event and for inviting me. I appreciate it very much. Um, in the last, in just a little bit over the last year, uh, the uh, RFERL's Kyrgyz service, known locally as Azatik, has worked with uh, with Beck Tourist News Agency, Klub, and the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project, uh, and a little bit with Bell and Cap, too. Um, to report about uh, uh, this crime network this, uh, uh, that's been laundering money out of Kyrgyzstan uh, for, for several years now, uh, more than five years. Um, it's, uh, 
their latest report is about actually the, the money launderer, the person that was the, the man moving the money back from Kyrgyz, moving the money out of Kyrgyzstan and, and over to Turkey. Uh, he was a, an Uyghur, uh, his name is, was Ayrken Saimaiti, um, and he was uh, instrumental in, in bringing the money which uh, was coming from a company uh, owned by another Uyghur man who was born in China. Uh, his citizenship status is a little bit vague. Bektur might know a little bit more about that. I, I believe he had citizenship in Kazakhstan, uh, but he created this vast network um, that ran from China through Kyrgyzstan and then through some of the other Central Asian countries. Now, uh, the, the money launderer, the person, the courier, uh, I'll call him, Ayrken uh, Saimaiti, um, was killed last year, just a little bit more than a year ago. He had been working with this project um, to provide some, some evidence, uh, documents, uh, that, that showed how the money was being taken out of Kyrgyzstan and, uh, and brought to other countries, deposited in different bank accounts. Uh, now, there's a Kyrgyz citizen that's involved in this too. His name is Raim Bek Matraimov. Uh, he was at one time the deputy chief of the customs service in Kyrgyzstan. Uh, he's heavily involved in this too, according to the documents. And I should say too, right up front, that I was not involved in the project personally, although I've certainly looked at all the documents a lot. This was something that Bektur would know more about than me. Uh, but it was it shed light on on the on the world of corruption in Kyrgyzstan and just how how money is moved out. Um, it uh, more at least seven hundred million dollars, in fact, was moved out. Now, the reports are, are, are excellent and they're certainly worth looking at. Uh, there's a lot of, lot of good information there and I can't recommend them enough actually, but how do we get to the third revolution from here? Um, uh, Saimati was killed in, in Turkey, uh, it, in Istanbul, under a contract killing that was farmed out to some guys who were in Syria apparently and had hooked up with some Uzbek uh, extremist, Islamic extremist group and they had killed him. Um, it's, the details are all very murky. They apparently didn't know very much about why they were killing him. They believed they were killing him because, quote unquote, he was a, he was a bad Muslim. Uh, it seems fairly fantastic. Uh, and, uh, but that, that was all the information they had. The Turkish authorities have been uh, less than enthusiastic in looking into this. And the Kyrgyz authorities have also been uh, not, not uh, overwhelmingly uh, enthusiastic themselves about having to look into this. The initial report that was released right after Saimati's death um, did spark protests in Kyrgyzstan. There was protests last November against corruption in the government, demands that this be investigated in Kyrgyzstan. There was a, a half-hearted investigation that was eventually launched. Now, a, a little bit of background about Raim Bekmatraimov. One of his brothers, Iskander, is, uh, is a deputy in parliament. Um, another brother is the district chief in the place called Karasu, which is right on the Uzbek border, and is also one of the main transit points for trade running from out through Kyrgyzstan and into Uzbekistan. So the family is fairly well established in, in the country. Um, again, the, the, the investigation that was launched really didn't go anywhere. It concluded somehow or another uh, that the $700 million that was transferred out of the country, and people believe that it's a lot more than $700 million, but anyway, that money really didn't have any connection to Kyrgyzstan. So they, they pretty much dropped the case. Now, parliamentary elections come up um, and, and there's a party called Mekanim Kyrgyzstan that, that was involved in the parliamentary elections that were held on October 4th in Kyrgyzstan. Now, Mekanim Kyrgyzstan was always tied closely to Ryan Bek Matraimov and many people believe that he was the one financing it. There was accusations of vote buying long before the elections were held, months actually before the elections were held. Uh, not surprisingly, the Mekanim Kyrgyzstan party did very, very well in the elections. Uh, they came in second place. Uh, them, uh, they and another party called Birim Dik, which uh, the, the then president Soran Bajay and Beko's brother was in, uh, and was also accused of having bought votes and used uh, the influence of the president to. Uh, secure more votes, administrative resources to secure their place. Those two parties won by far the most, most votes in the election. Uh, it was outrage, of course, uh, you know, that because it was suspected in advance. So it was like watching your worst nightmare come true um, that this happened. Uh, so uh, we know that there was protests that started on October 5th. They ended up getting this government out 
chasing this government from power. Hence, third rev is this the third revolution? Um, and then uh, the next day, uh, the opposition parties, there were 16 parties running, only four got seats in parliament and really only two got significant votes. Um, so the other 12 parties looked like they were gonna form some kind of coalition government, but um, they, they moved very slowly. Their act actions were very coordinated. Uh, and in the meantime, another group, uh, and it's still kind of a mystery, not for, at least as far as evidence is concerned, we don't know exactly who was this, but another group, which apparently was much more organized, managed to maneuver themselves into a position where they could pretty much start calling the shots on what was going on. Um, the person that they, they threw to the, the head of their, their order um, was, is Sadr, uh, Sadr Japara, uh, who is the prime minister, was the acting president, and is expected to be running for president. He was in prison on the day the, uh, um, the day the revolution took place and on election day too. He was released from prison, uh, suddenly forwarded as the candidate for prime minister, uh, ended up getting that position within two weeks of the time that he had, you know, after he'd been in prison. He's been running the country ever since then. Now, people suspect that, that uh, Brian Bekmath Raimov and possibly other organized crime groups are, are responsible for getting this person who was in prison uh, catapulted from, from behind bars to being the top person in the country. Um, the connection with organized crime has always been there in Kyrgyzstan, right? This is not a huge mystery. Uh, you know, it goes back, you could, you could look up people, the Ahmad Bahia brothers uh, are, are something, if you wanted to look at what they were up to 14, 15 years ago, that just shows that, uh, you know, there was two brothers, one was in parliament, um, he was killed in a prison riot when he was visiting the prison, the other brother ran for parliament, he got, he got in, he was killed later, uh, gunned down uh, in an assassination. Um, but so we've known about the, the connection between crime, organized crime groups and the Kyrgyz government for a long time. Well, what's unfortunate about what's happening now is that it's very, if you could only guess at it and, and you know, assume that it was there, it's much more evident now in what's going on in Kyrgyzstan. So Ryan Bekmath Raimov has again come to the fore. He was suspected of being behind financing Mekanim Kyrgyzstan. They did quite well. The Sadr, uh, Sadr Japarov said that he was going to clean up organized crime. That was one of his promises. It's a famous promise I think every Central Asian leader uh, makes that they're going to uh, put an end to corruption. They're going to start a new campaign. So uh, Ryan Bekmath Raimov was politely detained uh, right outside of the security committee's headquarters in Bishkek uh, and, and brought in for questioning. He's, I think, technically still under house arrest. However, uh, he has been in a position, strangely, where he's, he's been able to meet with the head of the security service uh, and meet with, uh, with the, the prime minister and, and then at that time acting president, um, Chaparov, and, and seems to be negotiating the terms of, uh, of his confinement, not only his confinement, but the, the repatriation of some of the money uh, that, that he's alleged to have taken outside the country. So he, he's, uh, he promised to give, to bring back 2 billion some. Now, um, to, put this, to put a figure on this, $700 million would be, if I'm, unless I'm mistaken, about 56 billion some. So out of the 56 billion some, that he's alleged to have taken out of the country, he's now willing to give back two billion some. Why he has to bring it back, we don't know. Uh, they, they didn't say that he stole the money. Uh, they just said that he was gonna bring it back. Uh, in his talks with um, President, then acting President Japarov, uh, Japarov came out from the meeting and said, there's no point in arresting him because it won't help us get the money back. So essentially saying that, that there is no penalty for stealing as long as you're, and, and even the security chief has said that too, that there's no point in arresting him as long as he's willing to give back the money. Um, so there, there's no penalty for that. And like I said, the money he's giving back is 2 billion sum out of 56 billion sum that he's alleged to have taken. Um, so it's, it's, it's the worst of all worlds. Um, you know, Japarov has come out of jail. No one knows how he managed to get himself, you know, positioned so that he could be prime minister so quickly in the country. Uh, now he's called for early elections. He's probably what you'd have to consider to be the favorite uh, in the presidential election scheduled for January 10th. Um, they're, they're also going to simultaneously hold uh, an election, a national referendum, at least that's the plan so far, on changes to the Constitution. 
the changes would make it a presidential state. And as people have said, it's a constitution. Uh, it would give the president practically unlimited powers. He would be not only head of state, he would be head of government. Uh, and as I said, uh, it's just, um, you know, there's so many suspicions about who's, who's behind this guy already. Uh, he's, he's treated organized crime and organized crime, you know, it's alleged heads of organized criminal groups with kid gloves from the start. Uh, another one, Kamchi, uh, uh, Kamchi Kobaya is another one who was also picked up, detained and put in prison. But it seems to be in, in very mooted. And uh, they will go back. Actually, they've never been, they would never have been in such a bad place as they will be if this referendum is, is passed. Um, so now it's, it's starting to create the problems in the country of, uh, uh, you know, as people are able to digest what's been happening because things happen so fast in the month of the people are finally getting a better look at this and it's being debated what what kind of system they want in the country do they want a presidential system or they want to scrap the progress they've made on parliamentary system of government uh you know who's going to be the next leader how much how, how much power could he end up having uh what will this do to, to kyrgyzstan uh, not only in, domestically but what will it do to his uh, to its image internationally uh, which has been the best of all the Asian countries um so I think I'm just going to leave it there because I know that that everyone else is going to dig a little bit more deeply into this and you want Q&A, but I'll just cut it off from there. Well, thank you for that, Bruce. Um, it was really interesting. There is a Q&A, so please ask questions away, especially if you disagree with some, some of the, what the panelists say, because a bit of debate is always great. Um, um, so, yeah, thank you for that. Um, especially, no question is too silly as well. If you don't know anything about Kyrgyzstan, find something, uh, find something, um, find something interesting, more, more detail on it. Please just ask because there's no, nothing that's too kind of, yeah, nothing that's too stupid or anything like that. So we're next going to go on to Hazel. So please, um, yeah, let me mark this is yeah. Thank you. Um, thanks for having me. Uh, let me introduce myself properly. I'm uh, Asiel Dorot Kelgiva. I'm an associate research fellow at the OEC Academy uh, in Bishkek. So, um, Bruce made this very uh, comprehensive introduction um, to um, the context in which um, the third revolution uh, took place in Kyrgyzstan. Um, and um, I would like to probably start my conversation with um, kind of um, probably summarizing where we're standing currently, um, and then uh, probably going to the question that uh, the very interesting and brilliant question asked uh, by Noah at the beginning of our discussion. So um, there, the situation looks uh, gloomy for those uh, people who um, associate themselves with um, uh, the progressive forces. And, uh, but it looks um, great for uh, people who associate themselves with the people, the end um, in the Kyrgyz language. Um, so why is it gloomy um, on, on the one hand? So we have a situation in which um, um, we see how populism um, in the face of Separov and his team is spreading fast, incredibly fast and incredibly effectively in the country. And of course, there were already sessions uh, in which we previously talked uh, together with Bruce and Victor, uh, the conditions under which this populism was possible in Kyrgyzstan, right? Um, but that aside, uh, one has to really uh, highlight the weakness of, um, of uh, the opposition, right? Uh, the opposition forces are fragmented. Um, one cannot really call them opposition, really. Uh, but uh, they, are, uh, they are currently unified uh, with one agenda, is to somehow stop the referendum to take place. But um, uh, while they uh, got united now in this moment, they missed a lot of uh, significant, very uh, important steps before. So, for example, they left the parliament um, whose um, powers actually have expired already. 
us to self-prolong itself and become uh, literally um, a platform for uh, justification and legitimization of uh, the product orders. Uh, they, uh, uh, the president of parliament, the speakers of parliament were um, changed uh, to finally um, let um, Japarov's best friend, uh, Talant Mamudov, to become the speaker and now the acting president of the country. And uh, what the position else did? Uh, well, they allowed actually, uh, they, they, they passively saw the cancellation of the parliamentary elections, which were scheduled very bravely uh, by the, back then, um, the uh, electoral commission for, um, uh, to take place in December. And uh, this, the, the whole process of the supposedly parliamentarian system is reversed. The presidential elections are announced and having primacy over the parliamentary elections, which is really contradictory. Uh, we should be fighting for the parliamentary elections and not the presidential elections. So the, the position also missed that point. Uh, and now um, there is a huge debate around the, um, the, the constitutional changes and the referendum. But again, they're missing uh, the, 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 this conversations, the critical uh, discussions about the, the, the constitution proposed by Japarov, although Japarov really denies that it's his constitution. Um, these debates are very awkward. Uh, they, um, I mean, I'm really unsatisfied myself while observing these debates because they all centered around the division of power. Who has the power? And uh, whereas this is a great moment for Kyrgyzstan to really finally get results things, uh, such as uh, if we are really towards the parliamentary republic, then we should, uh, for example, assign the parliament the role over uh, their distribution of money, right? Money is currently uh, concentrated in the hands of the president and therefore uh, corruption and therefore crime and uh, all those um, illegal uh, schemes are flourishing. And uh, as soon as the president will hold the power over the generation and distribution of the money in the country, uh, there will be no progress and there will be no reforms. But there are no even such discussions. So discussions are again about basically who captures the power in the country. That's, that's all that preoccupies both the, uh, the proponents of the new constitution and those who criticize the constitution, leaving the public quite unsatisfied with uh, the ongoing uh, debate. Um, and um, today uh, we were aw awaiting for this day because it was supposed to be a critical day when the constitutional chamber, uh, the, I'm sorry, constitutional court was supposed to decide um, over uh, the, uh, the, the referendum and over the cancellation of the parliamentary elections. And uh, although um, probably we were all of us expecting the, the worst to happen um, because this is the rule generally in the country. Still, uh, some of us hope that the constitutional court would be brave enough to stand against uh, the part of um, orders. So um, by uh, to the date, we are going to have a referendum and we are going to have the presidential elections and we're not going to have the parliamentary elections this year. So that much uh, about the opposition and the fragmentation and the weakness of those progressive forces, which cannot really stand against um, uh, the part of populism. Um, and now to turn uh, to uh, Noah's question about whether this is um, a time when uh, the liberal democracy is, um, um, is uh, in danger or not, right? Um, I think uh, so far um, the roundtables, these webinars, which were discussing the Kyrgyzstan's events, have been uh, narrowly focused on um, very important and interesting topics, uh, but still quite narrow, such as corruption and crime nexus, right? And uh, we haven't uh, started the discussion about whether this, uh, this is now a high time for um, endangered uh, democracy in Kyrgyzstan. And um, that's where I think um, it's, um, we should look really at the nature of populism that the part of brings, uh, because I think uh, this is really uh, not um, uh, surprising events. Uh, if we look back how the, uh, the welfare state in Kyrgyzstan has been relinquished and how the state has been reduced and therefore the role of the people has been reduced. Now it's basically uh, the time that uh, the people are taking revenge. And uh, if the progressive forces, which are the neoliberal 
uh, ideology people, uh, they uh, only seek to reduce even further the state and even further the role of their people. Uh, Chaparov is doing just the opposite, and that's why he is so popular. He seeks to capture the state and to enlarge it, and therefore his uh, I mean, he's so, his ideas are so attractive to the people who have been marginalized so far during all these decades uh, of Kyrgyz neoliberal politics. And uh, this is really of no surprise why we have such a high time of populism. And uh, yes, that's uh, really, I think, um, a good moment to discuss whether the liberal democracy is, um, you know, um, there, is, there are dangers to it. Thank you very much for that. That was absolutely fascinating. So we we'll now go on to Bettor, who's going to give a talk. So take it away. Hi, thank you. Can you hear me well? All right. So um, yeah, thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm one of the founders of Club uh, Media Outlet, which has already been mentioned. And uh, this has also been mentioned. One of the things we are most famous for probably during the last two years was uh, us investigating uh, the corruption and organized crime in Kyrgyzstan together with Radio Liberty. And I think it resonates, you know, with what Asel has just said, and she has just mentioned, you know, the um, uh, the power of uh, uh, actually how, how a state is losing, you know, uh, its ability to actually provide welfare to people. And at the same time, you know, um, how influential and powerful are organized crime groups in our country. And I think if we look, you know, and, uh, at, at the core of many problems in Kyrgyzstan, that's where they do lie. Uh, they do lie in the strength and uh, in the in the power of organized crime groups. And what everything that is happening today in Kyrgyzstan is the outcome of that. And um, I think we should try to find maybe even a more efficient way to keep on combating that, keep on fighting that. Unfortunately, the problem is that everybody in Kyrgyzstan is afraid. We have people who are very much afraid to even say the name of leaders of organized crime groups, even among politicians. You know, when um, when uh, what is now being called third revolution, although I have many doubts, we should call it this way, when it started happening and uh, parliament members didn't know what to do because, uh, you know, they were frightened by what was going on. And then they were gathered at one of the hotels in Bishkek just, you know, the next day after this large protest against parliament elections results. So uh, they were gathered there and uh, among people who were noticed in the building were people which are known to be linked with organized crime groups in Kyrgyzstan. Then there were several reports about some parliament members telling that they are being threatened by organized crime people, that you know they are uh, under pressure from them and uh, I think, and, and this was a very important message that I think some of them were trying to send, you know, that we are afraid, we are forced to do. Uh, and uh, and that's the problem that touches almost every branch of power in Kyrgyzstan. I think the same happens to our court system. Uh, I think uh, all of our judges are uh, frightened the same way, including the judges of the uh, constitutional uh, chamber of the Supreme Court, who today made this uh, shameful decision of acknowledging, you know, uh, or what, all, the, all the illegal actions that has been going on in Kyrgyzstan during the last two months. Uh, every, everybody is afraid for their lives, I think, for their safety. Everybody is afraid to be imprisoned because there has been so many people imprisoned uh, in, uh, in, you know, very controversial cases and in very controversial circumstances. Every, everybody can be imprisoned at any point if, you know, uh, if uh, if criminal groups or whoever ha has has power decides that this person should be imprisoned, this is a, a very harsh reality of what Kyrgyzstan is like. We are not living uh, in a country with the rule of law. Uh, we are living in a country that is controlled by organized crime groups. We should be honest to say this: uh, the country where uh, you know the law exists just you know mm, to imitate uh, the existence of a state, but in reality it just doesn't function at all. Uh, in reality, the one who has, you know, uh, enough forces uh, uh, to to uh, to also, you know, uh, physically attack their opponents or to threaten their opponents, 
uh, or to threaten them, you know, with the links with organized crime groups, these people will get the power. This is unfortunately, you know, what reality in Kyrgyzstan looks like. And it seems like Japarov has these connections uh, and it seems like uh, Kamchi Kolbayev has a lot of power in Kyrgyzstan, one of our organized crime leaders. And it seems like it was him who was actually threatening and frightening, you know, uh, all the politicians in our country and uh, people from all the branches of power. So we should do something to fight against this, first of all, I think. And this will be hard, this will be dangerous. Uh, Kyrgyzstan will most likely uh, become a country with, a, uh, with, with yet another attempt to establish the authoritarian rule. Um, uh, there will be victims, unfortunately. Uh, I think there will be imprisoned uh, politicians, there will be imprisoned journalists, there will be imprisoned civil activists. Uh, but we somehow have to fight against it. And uh, we were thinking, you know, how should we do that? What would be the most efficient way to start doing that? Um, and uh, I think uh, uh, we, should, we should look at several points here. Uh, first, you know, uh, we should understand that organized crime is so powerful because it is organized, because it has links, you know, with uh, criminal groups from other countries. And uh, maybe we should organize the same way. You know, we civil society activists, journalists, whoever wants to fight this, we should organize in the same strong networks all over the world uh, to look for them uh, and uh, to trace their money, uh, to make all the best possible efforts to leave them without this money. If we defund our organized crime groups, uh, that will probably make a huge change in Kyrgyzstan. Now, uh, uh, I, think, I think our audience is mostly people who are not from Kyrgyzstan, mostly people who are from, uh, as I can see, uh, from from you know you know Europe and uh, North America, and uh, why it matters to you, and I think uh, uh, that's another point that everybody should understand, is that uh, the organized crime that flourishes in countries like Kyrgyzstan uh, ends up spending its money in your countries. You know uh, this is a huge problem, and this is what helps make it stable. This is what helps make it you know keep on being rich. That that what helps uh, fuel corruption even more in our countries. When we investigated, you know, this uh, uh, organized crime ring, this uh, whole corruption scheme uh, related to Matraimov and uh, uh, and Abdul Qadir family, um, we realized that they laundered uh, a significant portion of the money that they illegally earned in Kyrgyzstan. They spent it and laundered it in countries like Germany, the UK, the US, and the uh, United Arab Emirates. Uh, they, they managed to buy, you know, uh, houses in, in the US, they invested into real estate in, in the UK, they, they built the whole new building in Augsburg, Germany. So um, if you want to help Kyrgyzstan, and also if you want to help the whole world to get rid of organized crime, because in the end, all of us are suffering from it, uh, try on all the possible levels that you know, and that you can influence, try to stop this money flow because uh, this will help us a lot. Again, if we, uh, you know, uh, if we uh, leave these people without sources of funding, if we leave these people without money, if we put sanctions on these people, uh, on, on the organized crime people in Kyrgyzstan, um, that will really be a huge game changer. Before that, we will be forever in this vicious cycle of you know, uh, presidents being toppled, but then another, another person would come uh, also supported by organized crime group and so on. You know, I mean, it will just repeat and repeat and repeat unless, you know, we break this chain somewhere. And I think one of the best ways to break it is to leave them without the money. This will be a key. Um, and, uh, and I mean, uh, in general, it is, it is very important, I think, for people from countries like the US or European Union, because uh, we see, you know, uh, the... Um, when, when, you know, organized crime especially becomes part of the government and starts getting even more money, um, and especially if this country is rich and has a lot of natural resources, um, then, uh, you know, we see uh, some amazing outcomes of this country trying to influence uh, the political situation in, in, the, in the Western part of the world as well. So it's really in your interest to <laughs> join us in fighting this organized crime. Uh, and. Um, I think I think this is a foundation, and and uh, of course you know, uh, at the same time we should keep on uh, investing into other areas of life. So you know I'm I'm kind of preparing to, uh, uh, to to design kind of a roadmap for myself, but maybe uh, it will be useful for other people from the civil side of Kyrgyzstan. How we're gonna live during the authoritarian times of Sadr Japarov? Uh, I know this is like may maybe it will not happen, but there is very very high probability it will. 
so of course, uh, uh, part of the fight should be, you know, this open fight with protests, with, you know, uh, investigating, uh, investigating organized crime and investigating corruption. But then at the same time, I think we should uh, invest even more in education, uh, in, uh, especially in education all around our country and uh, in, you know, bringing our kids uh, to other countries and showing them the world, uh, investing into, into them, you know, uh, being people with really uh, strong, uh, critical thinking skills, uh, professionals who would be able to, you know, earn a lot of money and they would not be dependent on, you know, uh, on, 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 on the poverty which exists in Kyrgyzstan, which also drives, you know, organized crime uh, to flourish. Um, so yeah, sorry for being a bit emotional, but uh, uh, that's the way I see it from within uh, the country right now. Oh, thank you very much. Um, please, yeah, please just use the Q&A function if you want to ask questions. Well, I've got a few questions already and they're excellent. So um, yeah, please use that. And we're now kind of going for a macro look. Or, uh, we've, kind of, we've kind of gone from really kind of like in kind of thing and kind of zooming outwards a bit. So now we've got Dila who's kind of going to kind of finish off the kind of the, the talks and then we're heading to the question. Um, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Dula. Um, thank you for being here. I, I want to I want to start with something um, very um, important for the region of Central Asia. Uh, Central Asia, uh, Central Asian states gained independence in early 1990s. When you lose your colonial power, when, when you gain independence from your colonial power, first thing you do is build your nationhood build your statehood. That is what happened with Central Asian states. states. They di dived into building their statehood mostly from scratch. And even then, during that time, they never shelved the regionalization on some back burner. They, they kept that regional ambition alive. And very early on, Central Asian states, a presence of Central Asian states met in Tashkent. And they decided that Central Asian countries will no longer be called Middle Asian, Middle Asia. The region will not be called Middle Asia in Kazakhstan, but it would be called Central Asia. Uh, and they collectively adopted that name. And then from then on, they started building regional structures such as Central Asian uh, Union, uh, which, which uh, literature says that uh, uh, more or less a successful uh, regional structure that allowed Central Asian countries to cooperate in the areas of mostly security, but nevertheless, that, that brought uh, five countries together. That was one of the uh, indigenous uh, regional structures that was built by five states. But unfortunately, um, the regional environment and uh, external influence meant that uh, regionalization had had to be paused. Uh, so for a decade between 2000, early 2000s and to, leading up to 2016, um, regionalization became stagnant. So did the uh, economic, uh, so did the national politics of uh, Central Asian states. Now, um, Central Asia, if you zoom out and have a look at the world map and look at Central Asia, Central Asia is a geopolitical entity. It's a, it's where interests of major powers intersect. We're surrounded by Russia, China. We have in the South, we have Pakistan, uh, India, and we have Iran. And now West is also interested. So if you're such a geopolitical entity with considerable mineral resources, with a civilizational potential, with an economic potential, and then you have powers intersecting, and then you're all loose and disintegrated. It, it's you're bound to lose a lot by this because by standing together, by being together, by building up your regional capacity as well as your global activeness means that you will decide your own destiny. You won't become a chess game uh, for other big powers. Ultimately, you know what you need. You know what you have to do. Now, look at this. Central Asia landlocked, five landlocked countries. We need each other. We can't leave. We're not an island on our own. We, we need each other. And that also means when you landlocked, the most important commodity, water, we share water. For 30 years, it's remarkable that 
there was a little bit of discord between these five countries over water, but it never fl fledged into a big scale scandal or violence. You know, for 30 years, we managed to share this water as, as well as we could. And in 2016, the change in um, power in Uzbekistan brought a new president, uh, Shaket Mirziyoyev, who, who is keen to build a democratic system, who is trying to uh, re make democratic reforms. And then that was followed by power transition in Kazakhstan, another economically um, strong country in Central Asia. And together they, they decided that Central Asia would be the focal point of their foreign policy. So that means that from 2016 on, Central Asian states have been cooperating together, trying to bring spring to regionalization again. And during that time, most of our demarcation, border demarcation and border delimitation problems have been solved between these five states without the um, input of external powers. For the first time in a decade, Central Asian's head of state met in Kazakhstan for consultative meeting without the, uh, without the presence of another foreign power. This is all very good news. And that was possible because of the uh, reform slowly taking place in Kazakhstan, in, 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 in Uzbekistan. And now we have uh, Kyrgyzstan. Um, within a two months, we've had um, significant changes. Four, fourth prime minister has been appointed. Third president has been appointed. Imagine in these two months, and then there is a talk of constitutional reform. Now, for Central Asia, Central Asia to become truly central, when they adopted the name Central Asia, they thought Central Asia would become center to the north, south, west, and east. We would serve as a transit area, transport uh, link that would link all these places that would also help us build our economy. Million Central Asian uh, Central Asians a year enter labor force, more or less a million. This is an unbelievable potential. We could have them in Central Asia build our, our common home. Remember that Central Asia for, hundreds and hundreds of years lived without political and economic boundaries. We lived together in one civilizational space. We, we lived in peace and harmony uh, to more, to large degree. And now we have all these barriers and we once again trying to bring them down. And the events in, say, in Kyrgyzstan is very worrying from that point of view because now Central Asian leaders, four Central Asian leaders have <gasps> issued a joint statement um, urging uh, Kyrgyzstan to respect the constitution, to follow the constitution. And so Kyrgyzstan in Central Asia represents a glimmer of hope for, for democracy, you see. They have managed to oust corrupt leaders three times now, not twice. Nowhere else in Central Asia this has happened. And now uh, the constitutional talk of turning a parliamentary system into super presidential system is not move, for, it does not mean that we're moving forward. It means we're moving backwards. For us to achieve our transit potential, our civilization potential, we should be moving forward. And now our relations with um, European Union, who has been the biggest champion of regional um, capacity building in Central Asia, who has been with us for nearly a decade trying to help Central Asian states to build their regional capacity. Now we have such an influential international actor who is willing to help us to do this, who's willing to support us to do this. And now we are at a brink of this where Kyrgyzstan could become authoritarian and could revert back. And once again, Central Asian countries could become disintegrated and loose and no longer together and could be divided and pitted against each other by external powers who do not wish to see Central Asian regional activeness grow. So um, this, from that point of view, it's very worrying. And, and uh, at a time when um, a year ago in 2019, um, we had a Central Asian forum where uh, for the first time civil society um, uh, members took, par uh, took part um, in a forum with the government officials uh, and with, uh, with the presence of European Union. Uh, and as things were going, more or less in a positive direction. Uh, now we, we have um, uh, we have a very um, 
a worrying event happening uh, with, our, uh, well, with Kyrgyzstan. And Kyrgyzstan is a, is a very essential part of Central Asian um, uh, project, uh, especially to fulfill our transit potential potential uh, to have access to East uh, Kyrgyzstan plays an important role and uh, the growing uh, if if uh, corruption and organized crime will once again take hold uh, we will lose that um, very very fragile um, um, project we've been building uh, this trust building between five countries has not been easy and we have been slowly getting there, uh, and, and now um, we don't know. We are all watching with uh, with uh, eyes wide open and hoping that um, this will be an opportunity for Kyrgyz people to reclaim uh, what they came out for, and not give up more powers. Uh, and um, so, uh, with a big sigh, um, that is uh, where we are. And yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, David. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, just before the Q&A, I just want to highlight a couple of things. One of them is a couple of events for the Your Politics Society that are coming up. In mid-December, we're having a talk about um, uh, Australian, the Australian immigration system, which is going to be kind of uh, trialling, and it's going to be kind of passing over to the UK uh, pretty soon when we leave on the 31st December. Then on the 21st of January, we have the former head of the Supreme Court, uh, Baroness uh, Hale, coming to speak to us. So I hope lots of you, even if you're not in the politics society, will turn up to these events because uh, they're really going to be really interesting. So I'm just going to answer the question in the order that they were asked, asked in. So please don't kind of, if your question gets mixed out, missed out, and you're, you think you're first, please, I'm not trying, it's not a personal slight at all. So the first question to anyone uh, is, uh, with Jeropov's potential win in January and subsequent continuation of populist rhetoric, how do you see Kyrgyzstan's relations with neighbours and the region in, in general changing, if at all? So whoever wants to answer that, just go ahead. From Rebecca Clark. Sure, I'll do it. Why not? I'll take this one. Hello, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay. Well, let's let's look at it this way. Kyrgyzstan's already had two revolutions, and they totally, you know, I mean, the government has changed drastically. Uh, you know, Akayev was replaced by Bakiev. Uh, Bakia was replaced by kind of a coalition government with Rosot and Bayev at the start. So the neighboring states are, are, have at least experienced this before. And they've shown that while they're unhappy, generally, because this is a bad precedent, no, one, no, one in, no leader in Central Asia wants to see a revolution anywhere in Central Asia. So this is not something they welcome. But they've always managed to come around and, and find some some common ground with Kyrgyzstan, uh, you know, and as Sel had mentioned, and, and, and Bektur had alluded to it too, that there's the ties between organized crimes groups are, of course, transnational. Uh, you know, when I was talking about Abdu, uh, Habibullah Abdul Qadir, he's, you know, alleged to be running goods from China through Kyrgyzstan, and, and he had, the, you know, he was a market, uh, the Abu Sahi market in Tashkent was one of the main unloading grounds for a lot of the goods that he was bringing through. And of course, he himself has Kazakh citizenship. So this will give you an idea of the networking that goes on there. Now, the governments won't be happy to have to deal with a new government, but they'll find common ground. In the meantime, the informal authorities uh, and criminal groups are, have connections that won't be affected by the change of government practically at all. Thank you very much for, who are, for Rebecca for asking that question, for Bruce for answering. Right, the next one is a kind of a three-parter. So I'll just start with the first one and then we'll go through them. And it's it, yeah, person's anonymous. So the first one is um, how uh, yeah, how popular is Jarapov actually? Or Japanov, sorry. So I'm not from Russia or Kyrgyzstan. But I'll speak a little bit. So if any of the pronunciations are terrible I'll, or a bunch of the names, I'm really sorry. Just put that out there. So yeah, how, how popular is uh, Japanov? Uh, well, I probably could answer this question. Uh, the path is uh, uh, quite popular, and this can be observed um, um, on social media, uh, first of all, um, and second of all, also um, on um, during the elections, his um, party um, 
uh, came um, actually, uh, well, we don't, we still don't know the results, the, the official results of those elections. Uh, but the ways uh, the authorities on, on the night uh, of the elections were playing with the numbers suggests that actually uh, the Paras party were, uh, has gained um, significant uh, votes. Um, and uh, from my own observations um, uh, during the pre-electoral period um, in the region, um, uh, people were quite um, uh, attracted uh, to uh, the program uh, of the Paras and were uh, going to vote for him. So it's very difficult to now kind of tell you the numbers, the statistics, uh, because unfortunately, uh, unlike uh, other countries where you can uh, uh, organize uh, polls and uh, public op um, opinion uh, service in Kyrgyzstan, there are no such statistics. So it's very difficult to really uh, play with, um, uh, with the numbers. Uh, but uh, the Parap is very popular, and um, not everyone, not not or not every uh, ordinary citizen is aware uh, of his connections to organized crime and to corrupt forces in society. Um, every critique against the Parap is met with a huge, um, uh, how to say it, uh, with uh, uh, resistance, um, and um, uh, there are uh, all those um, what we call them the factories of trolls. Um, and fake accounts that are, um, are hugely mobilized currently uh, to basically shield off the part of, from any uh, substantial criticism. Um, and uh, this is uh, working very perfectly. Uh, I mean, a lot of people, ordinary people, including my own friends and relatives, they believe in the part of as a messiah, as somebody who came to save the country. So um, I'm afraid that uh, Jabarov is uh, the most um, is probably the most important uh, candidate for the presidential elections and the winner of the election, presidential election. Thank you very much. That was yeah. Uh, and the final of this three um, is: um, Are there already indications how restrictions on civil society might develop? Um, is it already this was an issue before Jabarov? including, um, for example, the bill passing organizations receiving foreign funding? Uh, oh, yeah, I, I think uh, all those uh, law, the draft laws, uh, uh, the projects that were prepared uh, previously by the authoritarian administrations uh, will be revised. Uh, this is uh, uh, the, uh, um, the project uh, on um, uh, foreign agents, uh, which was imported from Russia. Uh, this is restrictions on internet. Uh, there's going to be restrictions um, against um, uh, NGOs um, and um, uh, many other um, implicate, real implications for um, the, the dissidents who speak differently. So um, I'm joining here um, uh, Victor in my pessimist um, analysis. If the part of going to become the president, it's going to be very tough times. Thank you very much. Um, the comments and that interesting notes are very fascinating, uh, but if I do read them out, we'll be here till midnight and pub is beckoning. So I'm really sorry. It's really fascinating, but thank you for them. And if you've got other interesting comments, please put them in, but I'll just, just know I'm not going to be reading them out. I'm just going to be focusing on the questions. So the next question is from um, is for Bruce and it's um, it says, after another round of quote unquote revolution, we are going to witness another election soon in Kyrgyzstan. Based on your um, experience, as do you think uh, Sadi Jarapov's victory is a foregone conclusion or that uh, might there be um, surprises in the offing? Which is... well, you know, I mean, they've, they've set a date for elections. That's true. I'm, I, I'm not totally, I mean, I wouldn't bet 100% that they're actually going to get that far and, and hold elections. We've seen some pushback already. There have been demonstrations on the weekend and they, they've been small, but they've been it, every, this last weekend was bigger than the one before. Um, you know, like I said, things happened so quickly in October that people didn't have a lot of time to think about what was going on. You know, Japarov's in jail now. He's now he's all of a sudden he's in charge of the country. I've always looked at him as a front man for somebody else. Uh, he could not have planned all this stuff in jail. He didn't he had some support, but he didn't have huge support while he was in prison. So uh, the Kyrgyzstan still has a lot of problems that he or whoever is backing him cannot solve. Uh, there was a lot of a lot of discontent with the way the government had handled the you know COVID crisis. 
Uh, there's a lot of discontent with the way the government is handling, had handled the economy. Those things haven't changed and they're not going away. Uh, you know, in the meantime, it seems like gradually more and more people are waking up to the fact that, that maybe Sadr Japarov is not what they're really looking for and doesn't have the answers for, for what they have. Uh, authoritarian rule is not going to solve, you know, again, that won't solve the health crisis and that won't solve the economic crisis either. Um, you know, and, and Japarov himself, uh, like I said, I, I don't think he orchestrated this. He's going along with it. Someone pushed him up in front and said, you're the guy, which means he's expendable, right? So if they get to elections, yes, he would probably win. Will he go a whole six year term, which is what he'll probably end up with because they're gonna base that on the, pre the present constitution. I don't think so. I don't think he'll make it that long, but they might not even make it to presidential elections. It's winter, uh, things are bad and, and we'll have to see. You know, The Kyrgyz people, uh, one thing I've always credited them with is that when, when they don't like something, um, they're not afraid to go out in the street and protest and, and, and protest for change. Uh, and as he is unable to solve some of these problems, I think he will be more and more unpopular. And you know, we'll see what happens if they make it to January 10th for this election. Thank you very much, Bruce. At this point, can I um, highlight the, uh, there's a great student room at York um, uh, Journal called the Cortado. Um, they, please check it out, it's really good. Uh, they're, they're under Facebook. They're, they've got a Facebook thing called Cortado Journal. Uh, it's every week and uh, they also need new writers as well. Um, I write for them um, on, and there's, you know, on Central Asia or the foreign, um, former uh, Soviet Union affairs. It's really good. Uh, I advise you all to check out the Facebook page. It's yeah, excellent. So and uh, I just thought I'd highlight that uh, before we move to Steve King's question, which is to what extent do the panel consider it safe for overseas organisations to work with authorities in the Czech Republic for, uh, on, for instance, projects to improve the public education system? Um, maybe I can answer that. Um, just, you know, get ready that some of your money will be stolen. Just be careful if you work with authorities in the Kyrgyz Republic. But otherwise, of course, we need a huge investment into our public education system. Uh, I just cannot guarantee that uh, the money will reach uh, its final destination. At, I mean, definitely part of them will be lost. But then we are the ones who will investigate it. Um, yeah, but if if there is a way to to uh, to do it, you know, without losses of this kind, it will be amazing. Just you know, I I needed to warn you. Um, for the I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, you uh, go ahead. I said please. Okay. Um, there are there have been in the past. Um, international organizations willing to work in the education uh, sector. And this is probably the most uh, needed uh, sector um, for donor programs instead of working on some stupid uh, things. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the Kyrgyz government uh, doesn't really request uh, the international organizations to work in the education system. And if the uh, recipient country does not request such programs, uh, then there is no mandate for international organizations or any other NGOs to work in this sector. So, um, and this is, um, I, I, I think uh, the Japarov's uh, administration will not be really interested in uh, raising the educational standards. Uh, it's much easier for a populist leader to keep the population in dark uh, rather than to enlighten it so that uh, the population doesn't rise against it. Can I say something about this? Um, so it's a European Union has a regional program called education, it has an educational initiative, educational platform uh, uh, that it takes a regional approach towards Central Asian countries, five countries, and they are working on reforming educational system of Central Asian countries so they can be uh, um, more or less uh, um, similar form to Bologna process, which is used by European countries. Um, so for the past decade, they have been working on this. Um, achievements are not big, but nevertheless, it's there. Um, 
from a general point of view, the European Union um, did not have too much of a problem in terms of educational pro uh, platform with Central Asian countries compared to other policy areas, such as fighting corruption and organized crime and, and um, uh, promoting human rights. Uh, but nevertheless, um, it, there has not been too much of an obstacle uh, uh, in terms of uh, cooperating with Central Asian states uh, in the sphere of education. So um, even if um, there is a chance that it might be stolen money or things are, uh, those things uh, inevitably will happen in countries where organized crime is strong. Uh, but if, if you are an education enthusiast or specialist, um, please don't be too discouraged. Um, Central Asia needs uh, as many, um, uh, you know, uh, as many um, people who are willing to support us in this journey. Uh, but uh, it comes with risks, unfortunately. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question comes from Artem Lazarev, and he says, what is the role of COVID in the situation, in particular the um, response to the COVID crisis in Russia, where many Kyrgyz workers come back um, 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 or wire transfers to their families, thus fueling the unrest? So mm -hmm. someone would like to answer that. Um, I could comment on this. Um, I think indeed COVID has played quite a significant role in the uh, social mobilization in the beginning of the post electoral crisis. And this comes very obviously from the interviews that um, I've been conducting with the participants of the, of the 5th October uh, uh, peaceful protest. Um, and COVID, uh, the impact of COVID on, um, on the political crisis um, hasn't been, um, hasn't get yet uh, get the, the focus of, uh, of attention and of, of analysis, yet I think it's really important. So people are, especially those um, residents of rural areas, they're reporting that um, since the lockdown, they were unable to travel to Russia for their seasonal um, uh, work. And they were, uh, uh, this way, uh, they were cut off from their um, uh, traditional, not traditional, but typical revenues. Um, and um, since um, uh, life in rural areas in Kyrgyzstan is quite limited, I mean, social life, um, and during the lockdown, a lot of young people were um, really um, kind of left to themselves, not knowing how to uh, spend their energies and their activities. Um, and um, especially those people who depend, uh, whose economic activity depends very much on the, on the borders, on tourism, uh, they really um, saw um, their incomes um, diminish uh, very significantly. And um, some, uh, for example, some of the participants of the of the protest on the fifth of October, they mentioned that uh, their COVID situation and their inadequate management of the pandemic by the authorities uh, um, exposed uh, the whole uh, ineffective and corrupt state of Kyrgyzstan, and therefore exposed even further uh, the inadequacy of uh, of the elites. And um, well, um, those who follow a little bit the Kyrgyz um, politics, they know that um, uh, when the pandemic began, uh, the members of parliament uh, simply went on vacation um, instead of uh, beginning to control the, the government uh, on their uh, pandemic management. So all this exposed how the state, the inefficiency of state and the inadequacy of their national elites. And people mentioned COVID as another reason next to the stolen elections as the reason for their participation in peaceful protests. So it's, I think it's really important to, to also stress that and not only corruption, elections and the crime. Uh, thank you very much. Um, right, so the, um, yeah, the next question is to Bechtel uh, and um, it says, and this anonymous attendee says, why don't you call, it once call this the third revolution? Um, you sound rather pessimistic about the future of Kyrgyzstan. Jakarov uh, is a future autocrat. Is there anything hopeful in these future elections? Um, well, uh, there is one thing uh, that I'm particularly uh, very proud of uh, in regards with elections in Kyrgyzstan. It's um, uh, it's the mechanism that we managed to build uh, in 2015. Uh, it was a reform which was highly criticized back then, uh, but seems like it works. 
So in Kyrgyzstan, it is a little bit difficult, to be honest, to organize, you know, massive violations uh, at the voting stations, uh, because when we vote, we have to submit our fingerprint. Uh, we have this automatic scanners on each uh, voting box. I don't know how it's called. So, uh, so we have all these mechanisms which prevent, uh, you know, authorities from using a so-called carousel when, you know, the same people are being driven to different voting stations uh, and, and, uh, and, and then they would vote. So it doesn't happen anymore that much. I, actually, I don't think it happens at all. And then um, we don't have a, you know, massive uh, throw in of ballots into, into the voting boxes. Um, but then authorities, of course, you know, since 2017, especially, they've been using other methods of manipulating results and uh, influencing the results. Vote buying was uh, the major one. But in order to organize this kind of violation, it is much more visible, first of all. Um, you really have to involve a lot of people and um, uh, it's really easy to detect. And that's what we've done uh, in October. Uh, we organized our own team of observers, which was 220 people all around the country. And they would film all the possible violations. And we had a very efficient team, which filmed a lot of violations. And uh, some of them would be, some of the videos that they shot would circulate all around uh, you know, social media and messengers like WhatsApp or Telegram and so on. And maybe they were one of the reasons that protests were sparked, you know, the next day. I mean, of course, I'm not claiming, you know, it was because of us, but but definitely, no, the, the, the videos that were being released for the whole day, that day, uh, were one of the catalyzers of, you know, people being mad at what was going on, you know. So uh, this time we're going to do the same uh, at the presidential election, but this time we're going to even, um, even, even make it more. Uh, we're going to have around 2000 uh, observers now. And uh, one of the reasons we're doing that, and one, one of the reasons we want to have that many people, most of them are young people, we educate them online. We've been, uh, uh, so we've already had uh, 1700 applications and we still keep on, you know, receiving them. I'm amazed by how many people want to be observers at elections all around the country. That brings me a lot of hope. So if, uh, if talking about, you know, what, what is hopeful about Kyrgyzstan is that I still believe that we have a truly, uh, you know, brave, strong civil society. It's just, you know, that it's not consolidated into some sort of political power or, or something like that. But, but we, but we have citizens who are indifferent to what's going on in the country, who want, you know, to to uh, observe, to change, uh, you know, the all, all these trends and so on. So, so we've got this uh, many applications. Uh, we're going to have a lot of people. Uh, most of them will be really young. They will be all around the country. And what is especially important and what we want them to inspire, for many of them, it will be the first time they're gonna have an experience like that, you know? Maybe it will be the first time of them doing something that is related to civil activism in a way. Uh, we're really happy about that. And uh, we want to inspire them. We want to encourage them to keep on doing that even after the elections. Uh, maybe election will be you no know, kind of a, a starting point from them, for them in their careers. And then uh, after the elections, they will keep on, you know, uh, being kind of watchdogs <laughs> uh, at the local level of uh, about what's going on. So, uh, um, and then, you know, we, we hope that it will have a multiplier effect and uh, they will kind of teach on a peer to peer basis other people and how to do that. So that that's, you know, that's my hopeful thing. That's what I'm going to do. Uh, and, uh, um, but, but again, I, I'm still, I'm, I'm pretty pessimistic. When, when, when I'm pessimistic, I'm pessimistic mostly about actions of our authorities. I totally don't trust them, whoever we call authorities right now, but anyway, I don't trust them. I don't trust our courts. I don't trust our parliament. Uh, uh, and these are the people I'm pessimistic about, but I'm still pretty optimistic about uh, people in Kyrgyzstan in general, and especially about our civil society. I mean, we have not said our last word yet, you know, uh, we're gonna fight. And um, and let's see. I mean, it's, it's going to be tough. It's really going to be difficult. Uh, I mean, we're going to face through really hard times, I think. But but we definitely shouldn't give up, and we keep on. We we should keep on fighting. And I mean, we've seen some interesting signs. You know, like I mean, this protest against uh, this new constitution. They have been uh, little so far. I mean, uh, we've had like around maybe uh, maximum five six hundred people gathering in Bishkek. 
but still, you know, it's 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 a sign. I hope that we 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 showed some sign to to authorities, and I was uh, one of the participants of the protest. Uh, and uh, maybe you know, because she, uh, right now actually we 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 not gonna have like a full scale referendum on the 10th of January. Uh, Japarov kind of postponed it. He said, okay, you know, let's have kind of a poll, which uh, system Kyrgyz citizens want more, presidential or parliament system. Still, it's it's not a referendum. So so he kind of made a little you know step back, and uh, we should just keep on pushing and and force them to make even more steps back. That's what we should do, and that's what I'm. Um, mm, uh, that's what I'm uh, positive about. Uh, that's what I'm hopeful about. That you know that uh, uh, we'll we'll have hopefully enough power to keep on pushing. Thank you very much for that, and thank you very much for all your questions. There's loads of them, so I'm gonna. Don't worry if you've answered your question in the Q and A section. I'm coming back to those, but I'm just going to go to the webinar chat. And this is the next question is from James who asks about, um, he says it was very interesting that neoliberal policies were mentioned as a reason for Japarov's popular support. And would it be possible to uh, elaborate a little bit more on the economic underpinnings of the uh, Kyrgyz discontent? He says, is it a COVID downturn uh, to blame? Is it proletarization? Nothing wrong word. And uh, greater ca uh, caution from Chinese investors. Like what's the reason behind this kind of effect of economic? I'm sorry, where, where do you see this question? <laughs> Somehow we uh, cannot find it. Um... It is above uh Mohammed's question and below uh and it's below uh try to find the uh, uh, the other Mohammed's question with an uh, uh, yeah um I see that uh, yeah um well um we just already talked uh, briefly about COVID and uh, I think uh, more research has to be uh, done on COVID's uh, impact on them um, economic uh, situation. Um, as for the, the part of base, um, you know, there are kind of similar trends uh, with what we saw in um, uh, Trump's base, right? Uh, this, um, uh, their, uh, their, uh, the economic uh, base of Trump support. Um, and similar can be said about uh, the part of, so he's growing support from the migrants, right? Migrants who um, have been for uh, years, if not decades, um, deprived of the, the basic um, access to a normal, decent conditions of life, education, health uh, in their own country. Um, and these are the, also people who have uh, no, no jobs, so we cannot even call them a working class because they don't have work. Um, I've been attending uh, several um, of um, uh, protests organized in support of the part of in those uh, tumultuous um, uh, days uh, in the beginning of October. And um, although there is a, this a widespread um, uh, conspiracy theory that uh, the part of um, uh, professors were all buffed and organized from above, from the top, and that these are not genuine um, discontent, this is not true. Uh, the part of uh, really supporters are real; they are genuine, and these are people who really were coming to the to the main plaza to support him. And this, uh, I've, I've been talking to these people, and uh, a lot of them are homeless, a lot of them are jobless, a lot of them are migrants. And they were taking the microphone turn by turn and basically using this opportunity to lament about their life, their very uh, poor life, and the hoping that uh, the part of as somebody who represents them, they see them as uh, one of, their, of theirs, uh, not disconnected from them, not like those elites who are too much far away from their uh, ordinary citizens. Um, and the part of growth uh, from that base uh, to uh, basically uh, become the, the next president. Um, yeah, I hope this uh, answers uh, the question. Um, Basil, the next question is for you as well. You're very, you're very popular with the uh, questions. Um, and that is about what are your thoughts on Bruce's theory about uh, Japarov being a footman for someone else? 
This is from Mohammed Tahir. Yeah, is it to me or to Bruce? It, yeah, I think it's for you. I think, yeah, it's for you, I think, Aisel. Okay. Um, we've discussed this already, I think, in one of the coverages uh, organized by Mohammed. It, I mean, there are a lot of speculations going on about whether uh, the Parap is an independent figure or is a marionette in the hands of um, um, somebody else, like, for example, uh, the Bakif, um, uh, the former Bakif um, president. Um, and kind of, yes, uh, I, I think um, uh, I know where this, uh, the speculations are coming from because it's so hard to believe how a man who just was released from the prison can establish uh, overnight a control over the country, who can basically check the parliament, check the independent elite, who can establish control over their law enforcement bodies and steer the masses of people, the crowd. It's really hard to believe in that. That's why there are the speculations that he is being helped by somebody, either by the Bakif family due to his former links uh, to the family, or to uh, the Matraimas and the organized crime. Uh, but um, for the moment, uh, these are uh, speculations, and the further investigative uh, research has to be done to establish such connections. Thank you very much. I think I hope you're finished. Um, the next question is, and uh, uh, we can move you back onto the Q and A. Is um, what can be done to make budget management transparent in Kyrgyzstan? So, someone would like to add to that. Victor, maybe you can answer that since you've been investigating corruption. Yeah. Well, I mean, probably. The answer is, in, you know, in, in what I said earlier, that there um, should be more ways, you know, to fight organized crime because it's all related uh, in the end, you know. And uh, um, mm, I think it would be great, you know, if um, you know, journalism in Kyrgyzstan um, gets more support. So using this moment, I'm inviting everybody to donate to Club. We have an amazing Patreon. Uh, donation um, page. I will share the link if anybody's interested. But you know, I mean, uh, sorry for still like hijacking the time for this. But but uh, really, I mean, I think it's important because um, um, we journalists are the ones who can actually investigate. You know, uh, budget management being transparent in Kyrgyzstan. But then, of course, a much wider work, not only you know done by us, should be. Uh, in fighting organized crime in general, and it's all it's all very much related, you know. Uh, and as as uh, I, th I think what we found in our investigations was just you know top of the tip of the iceberg, uh, actually. But uh, I think it's much, so much more uh, was going on in Kyrgyzstan when it comes to organized crime and how it's linked to the government and how government is corrupt, how much money is being stolen, uh, and uh, how much money is being laundered, and so on. So. Um, yeah, I think it's it's combination of of, of all of it, all, all of this. Thank you very much. And the next question is, who are Jakarov's main audience? Um, well, maybe I. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go, yeah. go ahead, Victor. Go ahead. Maybe actually, I think we can answer both of us. I will. I'll, I'll just share a little bit of what I know. Um, you know, Japarov is a very interesting person. Uh, maybe we should we should tell you know his story because his story is quite it's quite extraordinary. So he um, um, he I think became kind of rich <laughs> before two thousand five uh, by working in the oil uh, industry, like uh, you know petroleum whatever it's called in English. So uh, he was he was in the in that sort of business, uh, and then in two thousand five he was elected to the parliament for the first time. And um, he became a parliament member. I was surprised to see him in the video where first president Akaev is resigning in Moscow and there is a group of parliament members from Kyrgyzstan who came to kind of accept his resignation and Japarov is one of them. And I was like, wow, he was so early in, in, in politics. I forgot about that completely. So, um, so he was um, in that parliament and then he became uh, a government official during Bakiev times, second president. 
and uh, he became the head of the bureau that kind of was fighting against corruption, which of course it didn't, you know. Uh, but uh, at least uh, he was uh, having this title. Then after the you know, revolution in 2010, uh, he disappeared from, from you know, public view for some time. And then he resurfaced together with his buddy, uh, Kamchi Bektashev, another interesting politician who is now head of the security service. Uh, they re-emerged, resurfaced, uh, first of all, actually during the ethnic clashes in, in the south of the country, because Tashi was leading the protests against uh, Kadrijan Batyrov, uh, the main uh, ethnic Uzbek kind of leader in the south. Um, and I think this also kind of gave them some sort of popularity at, at that point. Uh, and, uh, and then um, they run to the parliament with the party, which was officially called Nationalistic Atajurid Party. <laughs> And uh, they didn't even hide, you know, the fact. And and they and, and this party took the first place in 2010. Uh, and Japarov, that way, he became uh, the parliament member for, for the third time, I think. And then uh, he became prominent for uh, his um, protests uh, uh, that were um, about nationalization of Kumtor gold mine, Canadian, you know, uh, joint Canadian gold mine in Kyrgyzstan. I think this also gained, uh, this way he also gained prominence because, and that, you know, reflects so many kind of post-colonial whatever problems that we have in Kyrgyzstan, you know, uh, many people in Kyrgyzstan living poor life. And then, you know, of course they are trying to find answers. Why are we living such a poor life? And 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 some, quite a lot of people believe that it is because of these corporations, which kind of still are, are uh, you know, gold or whatever resources. And uh, he probably was kind of giving them answers they wanted to hear. Maybe some of them were right. Maybe some of them were wrong. I don't know. Anyway, uh, his protests went a little bit too far at some point uh, when they actually kind of kidnapped, you know, the governor of physical oblast. They uh, put him in the car and <laughs> kept in the car for some time. Uh, and this was then used as a reason to start uh, a trial against him in 2013. And Japarov, being quite a smart person, I think, he left Kyrgyzstan for three years and he toured all around Russia and Kazakhstan, meeting our amazing, huge migrant community, you know? And I think, and that was his kind of moment of, of when he really gained uh, a lot of, uh, you know, popularity. Uh, and, 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 um, and the thing is, you know, for, for migrant workers, we have a lot of migrant workers abroad, like about a million uh, of curious people, I think, work in Russia alone. I mean, that's a huge portion of, that's a huge share of population, you know? And um, these people live very poor lives. They are discriminated on all the possible levels. They are not heard by our officials. They are not heard by anyone in Russia, of course. They are doing, you know, this dirty, uh, difficult uh, uh, job, not being paid that much in the end. And then suddenly, there is one politician who meets them, who kind of hears them, who listens to them, who tells them things they want to hear. Of course, he became popular among them. Of course, of course, uh, there is a certain, you know. I don't know, can we call it a cult of Sadr Japarov among, among a part of the population? And then, of course, they spread it to their families and so on. I mean, and that's how he built, you know, his uh, popularity. And then he came back to Kyrgyzstan knowing that he would be arrested, uh, knowing that he would uh, have to spend some time, you know, in prison. But during all this time, uh, there would be sporadically, there would be protests for Sadr Japarov. We just forgot about it. The last one before the, you know, October events, the last one was in March, and it was pretty impressive. There were quite a lot of people in Bishkek who gathered because he was considered like a political prisoner. Uh, uh, and I, I mean, he probably was, you know, uh, in a way. So um, that's his story. And, and that's why, you know, I, I, I mean, uh, remembering now how he made this, you know, uh, tour around Russia and Kazakhstan uh, and, uh, and, uh, and every, everything else he was doing, I'm pretty sure he was kind of thinking that, you know, one day he would use this. Um, Maybe it was a combination of both. And you know, I know, and there were, then there were probably some groups who, who said, oh, okay, we have Japarov, you know, who is popular. <laughs> uh, let's, you know, uh, join our efforts together. So maybe that's what happened. Right, our next question is from Aris. I hope I pronounced that right. Um, <laughs> uh, and she would like to hear more about those who are currently living in Kyrgyzstan. And um, what is the mood of the uh, people of Kyrgyzstan in general? And um, do they feel this is such an important and historical inverted commas moment as you have been discussing? And second, and unrelatedly, um, and how uh, Zakharov has been able to be so popular in the North and the South? 
sorry, uh, is the last question in the Q&A and in the chat. Sorry, I, I was getting there. Um, maybe I could start this uh, answering this question. Um, so, as I said in the beginning of my presentation, um, currently uh, the publics are divided into two uh, camps and there is a huge polarization uh, between them. So, on the one hand, uh, people feel very depressed um, um, by the way, um, by the ways that the revolutionary situation of the 5th of October was hijacked uh, by people then who came to power, the Japara team, right? And a lot of people did not expect that to happen at all. This was really uh, surprising. Um, and uh, because for some time being, for the several days after the peaceful uh, process of, of the 5th of October, um, there was this uncertainty, what's going to be next? And uh, that uh, Japara would be able to um, um, basically take o take over the control of all the branches uh, of power in the country under such a uh, short amount of time that was really surprising, and a lot of, a lot of people really got upset by this. And uh, especially the, the participants of those protests were telling that uh, this is not what they wanted, and this is not what they were protesting against. They were simply they wanted the cancellation of their of their unfair elections and uh, the announcement of the new parliamentary elections. Uh, some of them they even said that they didn't want uh, the incumbent president to go. That was not a, a revolution. That was not a coup against uh, the current um, government. And the, of course, then the, there is this other side of the of the publics who are um, uh, very fearful uh, because they see um, uh, in Japan their leader, uh, and um, uh, they like very much this populist ideas to restore uh, the justice by uh, bringing accountability to the people. And that's why uh, Japarov is flirting so much with these ideas of Kurultai. Kurultai from the Kyrgyz means uh, the People's Assembly. Um, and uh, this is just uh, a way, it's just, it's just a trick. It's a token given to uh, the people, to the public, to um, basically shut them up and not being interested in a more critical issues, um, such as uh, the, um, the division of powers under the Constitution. So, um, and uh, there, there is this uh, very uh, critical polarization of the society happening currently. So there are all the people who are called um, the, um, the Bishkek intelligentsia, so to speak, the Balkonsky, so to speak, are the people who, um, uh, <laughs> who speak Russian, who um, consider, consider themselves more educated than others. And then the, uh, there is uh, the other side, the so-called orcs. Uh, this is um, another term that was already uh, labeled by some of the analysts. Um, and um, I'm just very much afraid uh, that uh, the, the politics around the part of going to really clash these two publics against each other, uh, because this is not just about the part of, this is beyond the populism. This is about really who are the people. And uh, are these uh, people who are, have been marginalized and disenfranchised for the decades? Or these are people who live in a nice elite houses in uh, the capital Bishkek, who have access to education, who work in international organizations, who get their coffees, takeaway coffees in, a, in the mornings. Or, or these are very poor migrants and to whom the power should serve. These are really this kind of underlying foundational um, um, contention happening. And um, um, hopefully that Japara will be wise enough not to uh, clash the two uh, parts of the publics uh, while wanting to uh, get the highest uh, power. Right. Um, we're getting to the last few questions now, so can we just whiz through them? As we've, we've had loads of great questions so far, and these are really good questions, but we're slightly pushed for time. So this next question is from uh, Nicholas Lewis. Uh, so sorry we've got to this one so late, but is, it um, says, as uh, Azel hinted, uh, regarding liberal democracy. The problem is that uh, Jack Rav has support in as far as ex um, it is exposed to politics of the rural and urban peripheral po population. Um, Metropolitan liberals, ironic comments in Russian and English on Twitter, uh, and the debonair cover uh, coverage in plush interiors uh, of, for example, Aperol are not likely to be 
um, yeah, not like make much headway with them or, or even to be seen. If someone could comment on the um, strategy questions for the progressive liberal forces, that would be great. I think this is for you, Hazel. Oh, is it for me? Okay. Um, I think uh, Victor also in the position to answer this because we are both on Twitter and both probably writing in English in addition and in Russian. Um, I've been personally criticized not to write in Kyrgyz and this way educate uh, the Kyrgyz part of the population um, to bring in the progressive ideas, which is completely rubbish, of course, because it's a very uh, colonial discourse. Um, well, uh, this is uh, what I've been uh, just mentioning before about the polarization, uh, the current polarization of the society uh, and uh, the issue of the language uh, is, of course, one of the manifestations of this struggle uh, between um, two different populations who have unequal access to the public good. Um, and the Twitter population um, uh, who speaks English and Russian and um, uh, talk uh, the language which is completely inaccessible to people who um, in the rural areas use WhatsApp and YouTube as a means of communication and uh, their, um, uh, the sources of information. They seem completely not talking to each other, completely disconnected from each other, from the parallel universes, having their own sources of information and feeding themselves from very different sources of authority, knowledge, um, and many other things. And this is really frightening to observe how these two parallel universes really do not talk to each other. And um, just to now um, invent strategies for the progressive forces, how to bridge this gap. Uh, well, this is a matter of not just one conversation here, uh, but um, this is a matter of the failure in these 30 years of uh, Kyrgyzstan's independence of the absence of programmatic views, absence of the political parties, platforms and programs. Uh, th so this is not about uh, for Twitter users now to bridge this gap. It's absolutely not in our powers. Um, so this is really about the progressive forces unable to um, create and uh, communicate uh, their programmatic views on the on the politics and uh, um, bringing the state and uh, the public goods to uh, every citizen of, of Kyrgyzstan. So um, in that regard, this is really um, a strategic uh, mistake and a failure of the progressive forces. Um, and unfortunately, as I already mentioned, uh, because the progressive forces are also liberal uh, minded people who only seek to cut even further the state uh, services and the state expansion into rural areas, they are highly unpopular. Uh, they're, well, they're well respected by me and probably by Viktor, Clara Sorontulova, unfortunately, um, uh, enjoys only 3% of support of Kyrgyz population. This is nothing. So, um, yeah, I, I, I'm afraid that uh, liberal um, agendas uh, will not, uh, are not at least now popular in Kyrgyzstan and not in the near future. I'm um, sorry. Um, I should, uh, oh, should we, should we oh, wrap up? Or sorry, Matt, you get back to I forgot you there, sorry. Uh, yeah, I just want to add a couple of points. You know, um, I think uh, there, are, there are some things which should be uh, developed in Kyrgyzstan that would uh, change, you know, uh, life. And uh, one of them, surprisingly, is our transportation within the country. You know, it's so difficult to travel within Kyrgyzstan. Mm, uh, try getting from one city to another. Like we almost have no railroads, you know, and uh, it's a bit, it's, it's not safe in many cases. You know, it's, uh, it's very inconvenient. And uh, that's why we don't have the culture of inner tourism. Uh, we don't have culture of people traveling that much between cities. We live in many, many bubbles, uh, all a bit, a bit isolated from each other. And then you add to this, you know, the language issue that we speak different languages in the country it makes it even worse, you know, uh, in terms of how we are isolated from each other. So, you know, um, I think one who invents, you know, the best possible safest application that will make it easier for people to travel in countries like Kyrgyzstan between each other, uh, that will be amazing. But then um, also, you know, uh, language wise, uh, what we would love to do uh, is to uh, develop, you know, 
to make it easier for people in Bishkek to learn Kyrgyz language. I think that's going to be cool. Uh, I personally dream of starting my own reality show of how I'm learning Kyrgyz together with several people from Bishkek. And, you know, we want to encourage uh, people not to be afraid and to, to be shy to speak with accent or with mistakes, just to start doing that. So that, you know, because it's ridiculous. You know, I once went to Batkan uh, in the south of Kyrgyzstan and... Uh, uh, I couldn't even give a talk in Kyrgyz, you know, because my Kyrgyz is not that good. And then uh, I had to have an interpreter, which is so, you know, weird. <laughs> and uh, my interpreter was an ethnic Uzbek guy. Uh, and uh, it was it was so, so, so strange, you know, the whole situation. So um, I really would love, you know, us to, to be able to travel to each other safely and to talk to each other without any barriers. And then, you know, and, and the third thing, um, we have amazing, brave young people all around the country. And uh, uh, whenever we have, you know, this call for uh, any online trainings, especially this year, we have a lot of online trainings. We find, you know, people who are just amazing. I mean, they are so brave. They are able and ready to do great, really, really great stories, revelations, investigations, and so on. They just, I think, feel a bit lonely uh, in many cases. So, so we should, we should uh, maybe build, you know, stronger networks between these people. Like recently, we had a guy from in, in a. In a, in a remote village in Chatkal region in in, uh, in Jalalabad province, you know, and uh, he actually is now confronting like the local police and local uh, village council because uh, of his like, you know, video stories that he made about them. Uh, we are trying to all our best to support him to kind of, you know, encourage him to keep on doing that because uh, you know, otherwise, you know, uh, he's going to face a lot of pressure. So, uh, so that's another agenda that we ha have, you know, is to, is to keep on scouting uh, these amazing, brave people all around the country and, and make them, you know, local kind of influencers. I'm really sorry, we've only got time for one last question. And I'm going to, and it's from Florian, and I'm going to kind of slightly adapt it. And it is basically for people who are outside of Kyrgyzstan and go about the issue, what can we do to help? And can we, you yeah, know, very brief answers. Just and this is kind of a wrapping up kind of thing. So it, yeah, for for that because uh, I, I noticed lots of us were outside. Can I? I have a I have a very quick answer to that. May, may I? So uh, you know, this year we are getting used to online education. It's a bit painful for many people <laughs> because it's you know online education, but then it also gives us a lot of opportunities. Uh, uh, we this year, for example, started this online. Uh, class on journalism investigations and we have like 70 active participants right now and it's a bilingual class uh both in russian and kyrgyz so uh we've suddenly realized how great it is so uh people from kyrgyz community abroad you know one of the best things you can do is to uh, organize these sort of things because you don't need to travel to kyrgyzstan even to do that just you know start uh sharing your expertise and knowledge in whatever you think you are uh, professional, whatever you think you can share with people from Kyrgyzstan, I think that would be an amazing first step. You know, if you uh, don't know how to reach uh, the audience of Kyrgyzstan, reach out to me. Uh, I have this contacts of people all around the country who are hungry for knowledge. They would be very happy to, you know, to listen to you and to learn from you. And that's what we need to do. If you don't speak Kyrgyz, we have an experience of organizing bilingual courses. Again, reach out to me. Now, we have amazing translators who can make, you know, like uh, interpretation, <laughs> like of of uh, of uh, of the training. I think I think that's one of the best things uh, people from outside can do. I think this is really one of the advantages of having a strong Kyrgyz community abroad. You know, the one that can share their knowledge. Like, like really, let's invest in into education even this way. Uh, and then another thing, um, donate to uh, Kyrgyz civil society organizations. Uh, if, if you can afford this, like, I mean, uh, there, there is a number of really cool organizations who are trying to balance, you know, uh, everything that's going on. Uh, so consider, you know, investing into, into these organizations. Mm, yeah, maybe Asel can add something. Sorry, I'm occupying too much space now. Yeah, I would like to call uh, all the feminists, all the hippies around the world to come and visit Kyrgyzstan in order to organize a cultural revolution so that all the people who have been disconnected from globalization 
and think that uh, it's a part of uh, with his nationalistic ideas about preserving the Kyrgyz nationhood uh, can learn that this is now how the world lives. So please come and um, revolutionize us with your alternative ideas. I think that's it. Well, thank you very much for coming and staying, and thank you for, for all the panelists for you. Know, really interesting talks. I think, um, yeah, I, I, it's been fantastic, and I think a lot of people will go away thinking, um, yeah, thinking, oh my goodness, I've never realised that <laughs> this place even existed, and now I know lots about it. Uh, so thank you very much. If you've got any other questions, please email the uh, i'm sure the uh, panelists will be welcome to have the yeah email them uh, yeah please follow me on um, twitter as well if you're interested i post barely anything i'm rubbish but, <laughs> but just interested to see what other people think and say so thank you very um it's, my twitter's just my name so thank you very much for that uh thank you for the speakers and hopefully see events soon i'm hoping there'll be a uh, more kind of crossover events with us and not so hopefully they didn't yeah yeah, in the future. So thank you very much. And uh, yeah, it's, it's gonna it's gonna be great.